Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, basically, we're here to talk about class type metering today, uh, and basically more particularly talking about dealing and working with the class type usage data. Okay. Um, Something a little bit myself. Um, I've been involved with the cloud stack uh, pretty much before it was actually donated to Apache. Um, and I've been working with ShapeBlue now since that period of time. And what we've pr predominantly been doing is building clouds uh, for service providers, enterprises uh, globally. And basically, my arm seems to be more specialized or focused in terms of integrating cloud stack uh, with more back end or back end systems. Uh, within organizations. So typically they range from cloud portals, which are more like self-service uh, solutions, payment gateways. Um, also in terms of large CRM systems like SAP, uh, which a lot of organizations tend to be running nowadays. Um, and obviously other systems are like monitoring and ticketing and service desk solutions. Um, so a little bit about ShapeBlue and what we do. Um, Basically, ShapeBlue are a cloud stack system integrator, first and foremost. Um, we've been building cloud stacks now um, for about two or three years now. Um, and one of the packages we actually offer, or were the first to offer, was the capability to actually provide 27 by 7, uh, 24 by 7 support for Apache cloud stack. And as, as of from this conference, uh, we've also released a new product called Cloud Stack Forge. Um, and that's basically a framework which allows you to basically rapidly uh, deploy a standardized version of CloudStack in your own environment, it may be for a proof of concept or just to basically get it on the lab uh, for a fixed price and it allows you to provide all the best practices that we've learned over the years, um, as well as other tools that we would use for capacity planning, et cetera, okay? And basically the last comment is typically one of the uh, customers in terms of from a reference perspective in terms of what we do, okay? Um, so what I'll be doing today um, is a brief overview in terms of the topics I'll cover, um, in terms of cloud stack usage, uh, what we actually uh, can meter within cloud stack and how that metering is done. Um, then we'll look at in terms of uh, what you need to do actually to be able to capture that usage information in terms of what needs to be installed, how it needs to be configured, and the actual process in terms of the way cloud stack captures the usage metrics. Okay. And then finally, um, ways of the different methods you can actually access the cloud stack usage data. And at the end, I'll finish off with some use cases that we've worked with customers and the sort of solutions they're using to access that cloud stack usage data. Okay. So in terms of generally from organizations, what we see, um, the main reasons really that an organization wants to meet their cloud or capture in terms of what resources are being used is to basically really to be able to monetize and charge for those offerings, would be a VM, be it storage, et cetera. Um, and also additional requirements typically tend to be for reporting purposes, be that for capacity management, management reporting. And what we're seeing exactly more and more organizations are doing is that because of their own um, complicated billing processes and invoicing methods, that they require specific information or specific meters or specific usage data which can only really be obtained by directly accessing the, uh, the class like the usage data, okay? Um, and most of these organizations already have some sort of solution in place. They may be offering other IT systems, so they'll have some backend systems or operating support systems in place. So they don't really are looking for another cloud portal or something. All they want to really do is access the data that's actually there sitting in CloudStack. So today in CloudStack at the moment, um, what you see today is actually there is no, nothing in the user interface in CloudStack that you'll see that provides you any information in terms of what usage is taking place in the CloudStack. Um, there's no billing or any chargeback capability. Um, and there's no way to actually see exactly what the historical usage has been taking place within CloudStack. Um, so the way you typically do that is in the further slides that we'll discuss. Uh, what we'll be doing there. Um, so today, if you log in as root admin, what you will see is typically just a system capacity in terms of what uh, resources have been consumed in the cloud in terms of CPU, memory, IP addresses. And from a domain admin or a user's perspective, the sort of information they will see is in terms of how many VMs they've got powered up, but they can't actually get drill any down further than that to see exactly what those VMs were doing, how, how many hours those VMs were running for, et cetera. 
So what, what CloudStack actually provides then um, is what they call the usage server. Um, it's an optional component um, that you need to install separately. Um, and what you will then end up with is what they call a CloudStack slash usage service. Um, by default, when you install the service, uh, it will run once a day. But again, that's configurable through the CloudStack user interface as to how frequently you want that to run. And what the primary role of the usage server is, is that it will create um, usage records or usage data for all the resources that are consumed within CloudStack. Now, there's numerous resources, as you know, within CloudStack. And what um, the usage server does is for each of those different various services as they're consumed within CloudStack, it will basically record all the metrics, et cetera, for those uh, services. Um, and what the usage records are actually installed, uh, the usage records, sorry, they're stored in a separate database um, under cloud underscore usage. So you've got the CloudStack database sitting in the cloud, and you've got the cloud underscore usage database as well. Now, typically, when you install the usage service, um, or the usage server, sorry, it needs to be installed with, while the management server is running. And you can actually install, and the usage server needs to be installed on the same server. So it's not a process which you can install on a separate box. Um, you can actually configure it to be in a highly available configuration. So you can basically install the usage server on multiple management servers, and the usage service itself would coordinate and make sure that basically all the usage data has been uh, recorded in the database in a single location. Okay, so once you've installed the usage server, um, these are the parameters that you will need to configure within the CloudStack user interface. Uh, that's quite easily done um, by going to the global settings within CloudStack and selecting the, uh, just doing a search for usage, and that will bring up these configuration parameters. And what you typically see there is at the top, obviously, is just a, a clear flag which basically enables or disables usage service. Um, you then specify the execution time and when you want the usage service to run. By default, that's set to 15 minutes past midnight. But again, you, you can change that to any time you like. Um, you can specify the time zone. So that would typically be where your management server is running. So the time, that you want, the time zone that you want the actual uh, usage service to run. And then you actually specify the aggregation range. So this is the, the amount of time that you want the service job or how frequently you want the usage service to run and collect data. Uh, by default, it's set for 1,440 minutes, uh, which basically is a daily. So in, in, what it does is every day it will collect the previous day's usage data. But you can set that on an hourly basis if you want to. And then obviously the last uh, field that you'll typically see is the time zone that you want those usage records to be, uh, to be recorded. And just to give you an example, um, so we've got two examples here. The first example is there quite simply is where you're capturing the data every hour. Um, and again, just for the sake of uh, an example, I've specified different time zones for a specific standard time is when it would run on the management server. It'd run every hour, and it would basically collect the records on a GMT time zone, okay? The second example, is where it's set to default settings, typically running once a day. Um, and that will collect the previous day's data. Um, and it does that from a midnight to midnight basis. Okay. So the way the actual cloud server actually works, um, and it basically fetches or creates the usage data from the actual CloudStack events that take place within CloudStack. So as basically resources are created, deleted, paused, et cetera, those event records have been written into the cloud stack database. Okay, and the, the table is actually written to the cloud usage underscore events table. So typically, for example there we've got is for when a VM is created, a number of events will be written to the cloud stack events table. Uh, so the first instance is that a volume is created, the VM itself is created, an IP is assigned to the VM, um, it's assigned one of the network offerings that you've already defined. Um, and then eventually the VM is started. So you'll typically, in a separate example, you'll have six separate events being rec recorded when a VM is first created. Um, so just as an example, there's over 100 different type of events. Um, further information, again, what those events are can be found in the developer's uh, pro programmer's guide. Um, the only exception is, in terms of the resource usage, is that the, for networking, so in terms of the number of bytes that are sent and received by VMs, um, that information actually isn't generated from events. That's actually captured separately, uh, depending on what networking model you're actually using within CloudStack. 
If you're using basic networking, for example, um, you would need to use or set up what a, there's a, a solution called Traffic Sentinel. Uh, you need to install that on a separate host in your network. That will monitor the, the physical routers in your network and capture all the networking statistics from that and pass them back through to CloudStack. Okay? If, however, you're using an advanced network, you would, the actual vir virtual router provides those uh, networking statistics. Okay? So in terms of the actual process that happens for generating the usage data, um, so as the CloudStack events are logged into the CloudStack usage event table, um, the CloudStack usage run, runs uh, at a specified time. And what this does is it actually gets a list of all the latest usage data events that have been written to the table for the period that it's been set to. It then goes and inserts these events into the cloud usage table in the cloud use, sorry, in the usage events table in the cloud usage database. Okay. And then what it actually does, it actually goes through those uh, uh, records in the usage events table and it basically goes, starts to working out, providing the summary and the aggregated records. Um, and it does that through using helper tables. Okay. And the final step that the process does, it uses the helper data to actually populate the actual cloud usage database, uh, cloud usage data table. And that's the table that will contain all your raw data records and all the information that you need to generate your billing data from. Okay. So in terms of the actual types of information that you can capture the usage data for, um, we've got the VMs and we've got two separate different types of uh, v records that you can type of capture. One is for actually when a VM is actually running and that, what that basically means the actual when you start and stop at a VM, it's the duration that that VM has been running and you have started and stopped it. The allocated VM is slightly different in that that's from the time the VM was created to the time that the VM was actually destroyed. Okay. Now, depends in terms of what your billing mechanism is, whether it's going to be a utility billing mechanism, whether you're just interested in the actual time that the VM is created, or you're actually the actual running time of the VM. Um, some cases that we've seen, for example, for Windows Plow reporting requirements, those, that's where those, di those different sort of usage types become useful. Okay. Um, so as I said, the IP address, again, in terms of uh, how long the IP address was created and tracks that. The network bytes sent and received, again, as I mentioned, those are not created through the actual usage of uh, CloudStack events. That's by using these other product products. And there's some additional usage types there um, based on networking, again, load balancers, port forwarding, and when network offerings were created. Okay. Um, the last four usage types are more specific to when uh, there's a storage plugin that's been deployed. Uh, those metrics basically give you the ability to actually track the actual IOPS and the bandwidth that are used by a VM. Uh, but you can actually only get that information if you have the uh, a storage plugin enabled and the actual hypervisor that you're actually using actually supports disk IO polling. Um, not all hypervisors actually support that today the support is in there for KVM and Zen server to be able to do that. Uh, VMware and OVM, um, support for those are, are on, on the way. Okay. So in terms of the actual records themselves that are stored in the actual cloud usage database, um, there's eight different types of record formats based on, obviously, on the usage types. Um, you've got a allocated running VMs, network usage, IP address, disk volume. In terms of those record formats, basically what they were talking about there are the actual fields that you'll see in the database. Um, just to give you an example, that's for VMs. So typically what you'll have there is the name of the account, um, IDs, for example, the account ID and domain IDs. So these would refer to other tables in the database which you'd need to dereference to actually get that information. Um, so you've got other key fields there. You've got, obviously got a description of what that usage record is for, um, the actual usage type, and the actual raw usage. So that would be typically the, the, the field values that you'd be looking for when you're actually trying to calculate uh, any billing information. Um, the final fields there at the bottom, actually, start date and end date. Um, they actually give the time in which the usage was ca calculated they're not actually the time that the actual record was actually created. Something to bear in mind. 
So just to give you an example here, in terms of what a usage record may look like. So in this example, what we'll, we're doing is basically creating a VM at midnight, um, starting at that time, stopping it at 10 a.m., and then restarting it at 9 p.m. Um, so typically what will happen in the usage records, you'll see the bottom section there, the start and end date, as I mentioned, is during for a 24-hour period. Um, and the usage types, what you'll see under the raw usage value in the database is for the running the VM will be 13 hours because that's the time the actual VM will actually start running. Um, and the allocated VM will actually re respond with a value of 24 hours, which represents the period that the VM was actually created for. So once you've actually got the usage data in the cloud usage database, um, there are certain methods that you can use to access that database. Uh, one is obviously through the class stack API. Um, and again, that's obviously done through using HTTP GET requests uh, with the appropriate command and parameters. Um, and again, there are two ways to obviously access the class like API. One is through an authenticated port, which is 1896, or you've got the authenticated port, which is 8080. But obviously, you need to set up API, um, the appropriate API keys, secret keys, to be able to do that. Okay. Um, and in terms of from the actual API calls, really, it's only the root admin that is able to actually initiate those API calls. And there's three types of API calls that you actually can make uh, to actually fetch any usage information. One is list usage types, which basically lists what the usage types are currently supported in CloudStack. So it was basically the table I showed you a few slides previously. Um, then you've got the actual list usage records, which is literally the API call that you're most likely to make all the time. That's the one that actually fetches the actual information from the usage records, uh, usage database, okay? And then you've got a final call, which is used only in those cases where if, for example, a, um, the usage server wasn't running at for any particular time, so there's a gap in your billing data, if you actually execute that call, the generate usage API call, that will asynchronously generate those usage records that any bit that we missed. Okay. So a typical example here is of what an API call looks like. Um, you've got the 8080 port, which is the authenticated port. The command there of list usage records, and then you would specify, for example, some of the options are like a start date and an end date along with the actual signature that is required for that call, okay? And some of the other parameters you can see there where you can actually start to actually specify and, and actually request only those records that you're specifically interested in. So based on, for example, an account, um, the actual the size of the pages or the amount of data that's sent. So that's typical where a response you'll get to that API call I should show you in the previous slide. And the key fields that you really look, would be interested in there, for example, are the ones highlighted in yellow, which show the actual usage, which shows you both the actual unit and the actual value itself. Um, the raw usage is the, just the numeric value. And then obviously the start date, end date, as I mentioned, is typically in terms of when the actual usage period was captured. Uh, another mechanism for actually accessing the cloud usage database is using Cloud Monkey. Um, this seems to be quite popular at the moment. Um, it can be used basically within a shell script. Um, and what that typically does, it returns information both as in a JSON and a tablet form, whereas with an API, typically you've only got XML or JSON. Um, and the advantage of it is but the information you get from the cloud, using the Cloud Monkey is you can actually pipe it for further processing to other scripts. Okay. And again, some of the other features that you have with the Cloud Monkey is the ability to actually filter the results they're actually getting back from the Cloud Stack usage, usage database. Um, what a typical Cloud Monkey, this is an example of what a Cloud Monkey uh, list usage records call would look like. Um, so in this case, for example, we're specifying for a particular domain, we specified a particular date range, uh, and we also requested a, a specific account ID. And what that will typically do is bring, fetch all that information and display in that format there. Um, another mechanism is obviously using SQL. So this is where you're actually directly querying the actual cloud usage database itself directly. Um, and obviously the advantage in that is that you can actually do select queries and 
fetch results back in a CSV format, which you then feed into other solutions like Excel, exact, exactly. Um, the one thing about SQL queries, obviously the information that's returned is typically, for example, you'll have account ID, domain ID. What you would typically need to do is build quite complex SQL queries to actually dereference those IDs. So when you've actually gotten a, a string, when you're fetching it straight from the SQL database, you can see which customer you're actually requesting it for, uh, what VM, specific VM name was, et cetera. That's all done by actually stringing or joining SQL queries together. Um, as from CloudStack 4.1, um, basically a message queue was introduced. And what this gives you the capability is to actually use a message broker. And what that does is it actually, um, CloudStack publishes the events that take place. So typically when an event is written to the database, it's also written to the message queue. So now you can use a message broker, something like RabbitMQ, and that can actually fetch those events and you can directly subscribe them to another application. So that could be your billing solution, a monitoring solution, whatever. So rather than you going to the database or using API calls, um, efficient mechanism is using the message queue. And this way you're pretty much getting those events almost instantaneously. Um, I mean, in terms of the message queue, because it's a new feature in, uh, in CloudStack as from 4.1, um, there are, it was a blog written by Chip Childers, uh, which you may find useful in terms of actually working with the message queue in the first instance. Uh, and obviously, you can obtain further information at those links there. So once you've actually managed to get hold of the usage data, um, some of the things that you need to consider is in terms of mapping the actual fields in the data that you've just fetched with your actual target system. Um, and some of the considerations that we've come across when dealing with these sort of uh, issues is typically, a customer will typically always say that they want all the information usage data out of CloudStack. And the issues that obviously you can quite understand, appreciate with that is the actual sheer volume of data that they'll be actually pulling across, okay? So typically we'll go down there, we'll sit down with the customer and we'll try to understand exactly what their requirements are in terms of the actual level of data, what fields are of interest, and only specifically request that information from CloudStack. And another consideration also is in terms of the UUIDs we have within CloudStack, and this is purely for cross-referencing to be able to match what the billing system is actually seeing and what CloudStack is generating. These are the UUID values that you have in CloudStack is you also pass them through to the target system. So it's not just the CloudStack usage data that you're going through, but also you've got the equivalent or relevant UUID information as well. And then finally, obviously, the other thing is, apart from the usage data, the other things you may need to also synchronize are things like accounts and resources that you have in CloudStack. Because obviously, in the billing system, you want to then be able to correlate in terms of the usage that you've got for what VM it is and what that VM was called, which account it would belong to. Okay. So in terms of, these are just some sample use cases that we've, uh, with customers we've worked for, and some of the solutions that we've actually used. Um, one of them obviously is Microsoft Excel. Typically we've used this in cases where the it's purely been mostly for reporting requirements. Um, so that'd be for capacity management or management reporting. Um, very easy to do. All it really requires is that um, you set up a MySQL ODBC connection within MySQL. Uh, that connects to the cloud usage database, and that's able to then fetch the data from cloud usage database, and then you can actually create your reports or use pivot tables um, to rep as you report on the data that you're seeing there. Um, another reason we use that sometimes is when we're integrating with large systems like SAP, for example, is we will use this as an intermediate step to make sure that we're fetching the data correctly out of the cloud stack usage database, and then, the cloud stack, then when we do the integration with the SAP system, it becomes a lot, lot easier. Um, another product that we've, we've got quite a significant amount of experience with is Citrix Cloud Portal Business Manager. Now, what this does is it actually does integrate quite tightly with the CloudStack usage database. Um, and what it actually does, it uses the usage data phase. You, you can set up products within class CPBM um, and give it either utility pricing or on a subscription model pricing. So that's typically a fixed price per month. And what that actually does is then correlate that information with what's been provisioned uh, in CloudStack, okay? And in terms of the, from the billing perspective, you also have the options of it automatically generating the invoices and you can generate those invoices, XML, PDF. You can then actually send those or email, those um, 
invoices automatically to either other systems, to email addresses, etc. Um, another solution is Splunk. Um, this was an interesting one because Splunk, is, as probably some of you may be aware, is quite flexible in terms of the way it actually pulls data in. There's a, a whole catalog of different mechanisms for actually pulling data in. And in this customer use case, what they were already using Splunk for their operational data. So they were using it to fetch logs from VMs. They were using it to fetch logs from CloudStack, and they were correlating that within Splunk. Okay. So what they did there here is basically um, used now in this case is connect to the CloudStack usage database, and there's three mechanisms obviously doing that. One is obviously, as I mentioned before, is the, uh, the message queue. Another one is actually connected to the database directly. Uh, and then the other one was actually able to actually execute API, and it all depends on what the customer's preference is and what they've got in place and what the security requirements are. Uh, so this was able to pull the usage data in, and what they basically then got was a unified view of not just the underlying logs, but also in terms of what the capacity and what usage was taking place in the, in the cloud stack environment. Um, another solution is Amista. Um, very good solution to, base, to basically uh, it's a, it provides an integrated dashboard um, in the CloudStack user interface. Some of the other solutions, they're separate portals or separate dashboards. But what Mista has is they provide a version which integrates directly in the CloudStack user interface. So it's all self-contained. Um, but they also offer, obviously, a separate product as well. Um, and what it does is some of the capabilities of their product is that not only can you monitor the consumption within your CloudStack environment, you can also basically uh, include consumption from uh, public clouds like AWS. Um, typically, before um, the Mista product was quite good at in terms of for enterprises in terms of uh, chargeback reporting and showback reporting, but in I think recent developments, um, I think they've got a new product released recently as well, which is now catering for service providers as well. And just basically some links and slides which may be useful to you. Um, in terms of any of the slides that you see here today from Shape Blue are available on the link at the top. Uh, some useful blogs. You may find useful information there on, on the Shape Blue website as well. And there's some links there which you may find useful with regards to actually billing, etc. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, uh, to Tariq. That was uh, interesting. Uh, there's some interesting use cases there. One, one of the things that uh, I did before I joined Citrix is created one of the early infrastructure as a service companies, and we played a lot with our uh, usage data, and we created a spot market around it called Spot Cloud. You know, what, what do you think? Are there other kind of avenues in terms of this data that they can use for maybe financial type uh, use cases or things that are kind of, you know, more in left field? Oh, actually, I mean, what we, what we actually see is that um, a lot of customers... Well, majority of customers, they have unique billing requirements. So, they, for example, their sales model may be heavily based on discounts. And what we typically find is a, there is no single solution out there that actually provides to be able to meet those requirements based on, requirement, mm -hmm. uh, on, um, on discounting, et cetera. So those sort of organizations typically will build their own portals which provide the capability to do unique things with pricing and financial information and stuff like that. Yeah, it'd be interesting to think of like arbitrage across uh, multiple cloud stack uh, providers maybe, or even other non-cloud stack providers as a basis for comparison of, of the capacity maybe? Could Absolutely, be. and the other obviously thing is in terms of other services, so you've got PaaS solutions or any other solutions that sit on top of cloud stack, it's the capability to actually use that usage data and pull it in into cloud stack as well and generate a single invoices and single billing Maybe, maybe well. there's business opportunity to, to create something a little more uh, elegant in, in the delivery of those things. Absolutely. Well, thanks. It was definitely an interesting uh, opportunity, a different, different perspective. Thanks for sharing your, your insights. 